Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our final session of the day. Our final speaker today is author Luna Lindsay Corpton. Luna was born into the LDS Mormon Church and left the faith in 2001 at age 26. They are autistic and gender fluid and live in Washington State. Their book, Recovering Agency, Lifting the Veil of Mormon Mind Control, helps religious trauma survivors unpack their conditioning by deconstructing the manipulation techniques used by the LDS Church. Today, Luna will look at a manipulation technique known as sacred science, examine how this technique is used within a specific Bible-based group, which is Mormonism, briefly explore its interplay with other manipulation techniques, and offer suggestions on how to overcome its effects. Welcome, Luna. I'm so glad you can be with us today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, let me go ahead and share my slides. Totally easy to do. There we go. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, you gave me a brief introduction. Um, just a couple more things to add to that. Um, I am presently working as a freelance writer and researcher and editor. And um, my old career was I worked in the computer field um, in various roles over the uh, over a 14 year period, um, tech support, system engineer, sales engineer, uh, network administrator. Um, and But I've also always been an armchair psychology nerd. I started reading psychology books off my parents's um, bookshelf when I was little, you know, free to be you and me kind of stuff, um, which is weird. I had these weird juxtapositions growing up. Um, and But I don't have a related degree, so I like to let people know that I don't want it to false pretenses or anything like that. One of the areas that I've been really curious about is cults and psychological manipulation. Um, and so I, when I really dove into that several years after I left Mormonism, um, I devoured a whole, whole piles of books and noticed um, my religion reflected in that. And so I pulled together all of that um, after it took about a, over a decade after I left the church um, and pulled that all together into a book that sort of, um, it's less focused on my own experiences, although I mentioned those, but it's more pulling out the doctrines and the quotes that Mormonism uses and comparing that with uh, what other cult researchers have come up with. And um, the book is focused on Mormonism, but I've had people from other uh, groups read it and said that they were able to make their own connections to their own um, religion, which is, um, or group, which is um, exactly what I wanted um, people to be able to do. So, um, so what is the uh, anti- cult approach. So it's an approach that came out of the 1950s. Um, we've talked about Robert J. Lifton in a couple of other sessions um, when prisoners of war were returning in, with indoctrination. And um, so, and then the 1960s with new religious movements uh, kind of culminated with these researchers looking into this. Um, it started out for helping people through a process called deprogramming, which was unethical in and of itself. So that has fallen out of favor um, for uh, exit counts counselors is now what they call um, people who specialize in this field in that, on that side of things. Um, and they help a survivor process their um, conditioning. Um, and, and basically they do that by deconstructing the manipulation techniques and helping the person see the specific doctrines and how they were leveraged against them. That helps the survivor understand what's happened to them um, and validates their experiences. So I feel like um, validation is the opposite of gaslighting, which is denying your perceptions and experiences. And this gives you a way to feel like, yes, that really was real what I was perceiving and I'm not crazy. It helps the survivor consciously evaluate their values so they can consciously choose their moral choices and their, their moral um, outlook as opposed to having that forced on them. It brings self-awareness to the subconscious pressures that they may still be under and helps them separate their own sense of self from the group pseudo-personality. So the group has this ideal standard of what the perfect person is and everyone's trying to contort their own person into that person, um, which, is, which is very damaging. And so this helps the person discover who they really are. And it helps protect them against future manipulation, although with a huge caveat on that, um, manipulators are very, very clever and can bypass red flags if they so are so inclined and intelligent enough. Interestingly enough, when I wrote Recovering Agency, I was living with an abuser in a long-term domestic relationship and kept reading passages where I was like, 
mm, but I couldn't do anything about it because I was dependent. So um, it, it just goes to show that no matter how much you know about this stuff, you still got to be on guard and be aware. Uh, just a second here. Do, do, do. Um, so what is a cult? Um, we can't spend a whole lot of time on any one of these slides, um, but uh, we've talked about totalism, high demand groups, um, any group that is that puts a lot of pressure on you. I'll explore those terms a little bit in, in another slide. These aren't just religions, so um, these can also be family systems, political movements, businesses, including legitimate corporations, um, MLMs, of course, um, psychological, therapeutic, and large group awareness training seminar type programs, educational programs, um, you name it, if people can come together, someone can figure out how to make a cult out of it. Not all religions are cults, and I really, really emphasize this. There's a lot of atheists out there that all religions are cults, and that's kind of useless to paint it with a broad brush out there. There's um, healthy religions and unhealthy religions and um, the, all the ones in between. And um, if we want the world to be a better place and have more healthy groups of any kind, we need to focus on what certain groups are doing right and um, hold those up and promote them to help um, people who need some sort of spiritual fulfillment in their life. They'll have a healthy outlet for that. And then, um, and it's not a weakness to need spiritual fulfillment in your life too. I like to point that out as well. And totalism is a matter of degrees. So we'll talk about ethical groups in a second, but it, it, there's not, you can't just um, put things into a binary. This is a cult and that isn't. People always want to know, is this a cult or is that, isn't it? Um, there, there, it's a spectrum. You have, you have on one end what I call knitting circles and on the other end you have Jonestown and Heaven's Gate um, and everything in between. And um, a person, an individual's experience within the group also changes depending on various factors. Their family of origin, how deep they go into the thing, how close they are to the inner circle, um, how serious Seriously, they take the doctrines, how much time they spend on it. So it's all a matter of degrees. And so one person can have a perfectly fine experience in a particular group and another person can have a really horrible experience. Cult and mind control are both really loaded terms and we have all these false mythical ideas of what those mean from watching TVs and movies that try to simplify everything visually. Um, it is a long process of indoctrination. Other terms include, um, we talked about totalism and high demand group, spiritual abuse, undue influence, coercive persuasion, conditioning, thought reform, religious trauma, toxic religion, and so on. Within uh, a group like this, um, first of all, or what, what totalism is, um, so within totalism, the ideology comes first before anything else. And it fills every part of your life and just and decides all your decisions. Um, Sometimes, depending on the group, what to eat, what to wear, where to work, what kind of career to have, uh, what, what your relationships should look like. Um, sometimes even who to marry, um, who you can be friends with. Um, and it uses your natural tendencies and your built-in mental ef efficiencies. So um, it feels natural. It feels natural to be manipulated. Um, and often it can feel comfortable because there's a lot of thinking that's taken uh, away from you. And we can't know everything about everything all the time. And so, of course, we're going to take shortcuts. It's just a matter of are those manipulative shortcuts. Totalism is ubiquitous, but not universal. So um, it's it's everywhere. It's all around. There's all kinds of groups in every kind of place, um, but but not every group is totalist. The level of totalism varies. We already talked about that a little bit, even within a single group. Um, and then here's a quote from Robert J. Lifton describing totalism, feeling himself unable to escape from forces more powerful than himself. He subordinates everything to adapting himself to them. He becomes sensitive to all kinds of cues, expert at anticipating environmental pressures, and skillful in writing them in such a way that his psychological energies merge with the tide rather than turn painfully against himself. And that's from his book, Thought Reform and Psychology of Totalism. So here's my approach to the anti-cult approach. Um, I've identified 31 techniques across the literature. Um, some of these were named by other cult researchers and sometimes those researchers described a certain dynamic and I gave it a name. Um, in some cases I changed the name like I think blame reversal works better than victim blaming um, because takes that controversial victim term out of the whole deal, it switches blame. Um, and I think that um, uh, the approach that society is presently taking to trauma or PTSD is leaving out 
a really big part of it. There's a focus on the physiology and the triggers um, and the panic attacks and things like that. And that's, that's all very good and necessary. But for psychological abuse, there's also a conditioning aspect. The beliefs and behaviors that you're, are instilled in you um, that need to be unpacked in some way. And you can resolve all the panic attacks and triggers and take meds and do all of that stuff, but those beliefs are still gonna be in there unless you address them. Uh, and I, I've noticed that patterns of manipulation are similar across all types of psychological abuse um, at all levels of society. And it's a little thing I've been calling abuse culture. And I've, I haven't really written anything formal on it, but I've been um, tweeting about it under that hashtag for a few years now. Um, sort of like rape culture, it is um, a way that a set of beliefs that everybody has or many people in society have have to enable and excuse abuse. Um, and to allow abusers to escape accountability. And um, I believe that if we give people the information that they, I wanna trust them, that they can figure out what they need and how to use the information in the best way they can. Uh, this is the list of the 31 mind control techniques. I'm not going to spend time on this slide. Um, I can make this deck available. There's a couple of slides I'm going to skip over real quick. Um, you can take a screenshot if you just want the thing right now, um, or you can um, contact me later and get the slide deck. But today we're going to talk about sacred science. Here's a little chart, also not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, the point of this chart is that all of these 31 techniques work together. Um, they uh, support each other and interact with each other and fill um, gaps for each other. Um, no one single one of these techniques will work all on its own. And so, for instance, um, you've got to bypass someone's existing dissonance to convert them. Um, you want them to resolve any dissonance they do have in favor of the group. You want them to avoid dis sources of dissonance. And all, those are all the things that get, um, all of those functions are are taken over by those each of those individual techniques but in the center of all of them is sacred science so sacred science is kind of um, the reason for all of the other ones a few things to keep in mind um, religious manipulation is a, i believe a codified form of mental abuse that basically um, things that that are fa regular family domestic abuser would would use just with a family they get sort of turned into these doctrines that is then spread among a group Members of the group enforce the manipulation both within themselves, sort of in, internal thought policing, and also um, on each other. They keep each other in check, they watch each other, um, they uh, enforce these beliefs with each other. So if anyone is, starts to da doubt or, or sag, everyone's there to pull them back in. Abusive behavior then becomes seen as a greater good within these groups, and divergence is not allowed, so members are pressured to conform their identities to this group pseudo-personality that I talked about. Quick comparison with ethical groups. Um, cultic groups are high demand. They have high standards of perfection. They're totalistic, which is a complete and total isolated controlling system. They're deceptive and non-consensual, self-aggrandizing, self-promoting. They're preoccupied with bringing in more money, more people, uh, promoting their image. They're dehumanizing. They put the ideology first before anyone else's needs. Uh, they use coercive persuasion persuasion technique, techniques, which feel like you're choosing, um, but really they're not. There's trickery involved. You get punished for leaving or uh, bad things will happen to you. There's a lot of fear around leaving. There's no questioning or criticism allowed. And it is a successful strategy for organizations. This actually does help organizations persist and get bigger, but it's very maladaptive for individuals what I call it a knitting circle. So when you go to a knitting circle, um, you might go every Thursday, you sit around for a couple of hours with your friends and you knit. And that's it, that's the end of the group. Um, so it, this is what I consider like the most ethical group on the other side. So they may have standards for improvement, but no, perfection is not not um, expected. They're organized around a specific and openly stated topic or goal. So knitting, sports, um, a political activist group, anything like that is a very specific thing uh, that doesn't cover your whole life. They're uninvolved in your personal life unless it's directly related to the goal. So um, a, a sports group might uh, have good reason to uh, have concerns about your diet or your workout routine. Um, uh, a travel group might have specific times and dates you need to go on places and be gone for a whole month or whatever it is, right? But it's very specific to the stated goal. And members will have the same goals as the leader. So for instance, in therapy, therapy uses most of these techniques, um, but the difference is in the level of deception and the level of 
um, autonomy that the client has. I, ideally, there are bad therapists out there. Um, but the, the, the client comes in and says, I want to work on this trauma issue. And the therapist is on the same, same page with that. And they're working towards the same goal. Um, and that's very different. Um, it uses persuasive techniques ethically. So they're honest and transparent and use informed consent. It's a humanizing system where they put the needs of the individual first. And new ideas, disagreement are welcome. And people are always able to leave or spend minimal time with the group. Again, depending on their specific exceptions, a sports group, and they don't want you just showing up to a game every once in a while. They might have demands on your time um, with that, but there's always like a good reason for that. So here's why they're harmful. Um, they're deceptive, promise, which in itself can be traumatic. Promises are made, but then not fulfilled after you put in all the work. Techniques are used to keep the members from seeing this, and those techniques themselves can be abusive or are abusive. Um, control is done through dependency, guilt and shame, fear, unreasonable demands, and so forth. There's no consent or there's a guise of consent, but isn't really consent. Um, boundaries are unhealthy, so an individual may leave a group like this and have trouble setting boundaries or respecting other people's boundaries, usually both. Gaslighting is the norm, denying people's reality in favor of the group because the doctrine always has to take precedent. It suppresses empathy, understanding, and diversity among people. There can be a loss of autonomy and sense of self and freedom. There can be a loss of material time and wealth, a great deal of that in many, uh, many cases. The individual then grooms to be, uh, is groomed to be tolerant of other abusers. That's that abuse culture thing again. Um, bad behavior is excused and dismissed. The victims are blamed. Um, that becomes habitual to members of the group. The group is often insulated and um, from the outside, and that allows, um, there's no transparency, sunlight's the best disinfected, and when there, there's no um, sunlight, there can be a physical, emotional, and sexual abuse that no one knows about that might not even be perpetuated by the group itself, but it thrives in that environment, um, even just between families and individuals. And uh, it does can create unhealthy family dynamics and be justification for abuse within a family. And those kind of, um, I have a chart in my book um, that kind of shows how different family groups can have different experiences within, within a group like Mormonism. Uh, and if you have an abusive family on top of Mormonism, then those two interplay with each other and you got two things going on there. Here's Mormonism in a nutshell. It's an American religion that was founded in the 1830s by a self-proclaimed prophet, Joseph Smith. The Mormons fled the Midwest. Um, they were fleeing persecution, as I was taught, but also some accountability for some really awful things that they were doing. Um, and so they fled to the Utah Territory in 1847 and just kind of took over, including displacing indigenous people and um, anyone else who wanted to be there for a while. <laughs> um, they were led by the prophet Brigham Young through this time in an isolated theocracy that was pretty much like Jonestown, only it was a whole territory and in fact up into Idaho and they were sending uh, little colonial groups all over the place and it was for 30 plus years until they became a state and then kind of had to follow the, the government laws, the uh, federal laws. Um, and it claims to be a restoration of the original gospel of Jesus Christ. It is Christian, but there's some significant differences. So there's some arguments over whether they're really Christian or not. Um, from a secular perspective, they're absolutely Christian. The guy they worship is Jesus Christ. Um, I don't care about counting angels on the head of the pin as to the Trinity and who has a body and who doesn't, whether people can be prophets, all of that stuff. Um, they're Christian, in my, in my opinion. They do have extra books of canonical scriptures. These include the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price. And today it's broken into many sects. So the one I grew up in was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint, which is the largest one and one most people mean when they say Mormon. Um, we call it LDS for short. But there are a lot of other groups, um, particularly fundamentalist groups, but there are actually some groups that, um, at least briefly reading about them, struck me as like they went the liberal direction. They lightened up way up from the mainstream Mormonism. So, um, And the, the mainstream church itself has lightened up themselves compared to Brigham Young and Joseph Smith's time. Um, they, they do appear to be, for the last 40 years or so, attempting to mainstream and be accepted um, among other Christian religions. In, in the United States at least. And they're now very respected. Uh, there are a disproportionate number of 
Mormon men in because they're always men in um, po in politics and in American businesses um, out, outsized number of um, executives in American businesses um, way more Mormons than there ought to be based on the general population Americans are, are Mormons are very good at business and the prophet is considered the mouthpiece of God today so everyone has to listen to what he says and do what he says he doesn't really deviate much from the traditions but that's that's the deal the LDS Church owns most major media outlets in Utah, and there's heavy cultural and political influence in the Mormon corridor, which is um, roughly all the states centered around Idaho or uh, Utah, so Idaho, parts of Colorado, parts of New Mexico, parts of Wyoming, parts of Washington um, uh, are still very heavily Mormon or culturally influenced by Mormonism. And they have so much political influence in Utah, in Utah that some people consider Utah a theocracy today. Um, the, um, often when the decision comes down to it, there's Mormons in at every level of government, whether it's the police or the judge or the senator. And so um, the church usually gets its way in, in many of these um, decisions or legal, legal decisions and so forth. So does sacred science. That's our centerpiece today. Um, sacred science is what puts the total in totalism. This technique was identified by Robert J. Lifton in the 50s, um, and it comes in three parts. It's probably the most complicated one. Uh, most of them just have like one function they do. This one does three in one. So number one, it states that the um, religion or system is universal and infallible. That is, it's supposed to apply to everybody, and um, it can't be questioned. Uh, and it's the only way to solve salvation or happiness or whatever the end goals is or your um, ideals. And it does appeal to ideals. And that's why people join these kind of groups. If you belong to this group, you get to achieve your values. That's the prom one of the promises. Number two, the doctrines and leaders are indistinguishable from each other. This one's really, really important. The leader, the leader's word is God's word, or if it's not a religion, it's the one true system, whatever that is. And it is that leader is the exclusive access to the one way or those leaders. And that causes the, the members to conflate God and the leader. So when a leader says, obey God, the members are just assuming that that's, they're talking about the leader. And if the leader says, obey me, they assume that they're talking about God. It's just, it's all the same thing. And at number three, the ends justify any means. So leaderships can, leadership can't be questioned. They can't be doubted. They can't be criticized. Just to use Lifton's word to describe this, the assumption here is not so much that man can be God, but rather that man's ideas can be God. Science can be combined with an equally absolute body of moral principles. Its appeal lies in its seeming unification of the mystical and logical modes of experience. It can create an extremely intense feeling of truth. Bonus slide, some quick stuff, like thoughts that came up during this. Um, Jennifer French yesterday talked about omniscience and omnipotence and how um, leaders sort of take on this omniscience, we know everything, and omnipotence, we can make you do anything we want kind of role. And I thought that model was really interesting compared to sacred science, um, which does confer that mantle of God's authority, God's omniscience, God's omnipotence to the leaders. So it becomes easy to accept that the leader is um, omnipotent, even though they don't just Say that because if they said that it would be obvious and no one would believe it um, and that causes that omnipotence to be the leaders to wield and also it causes the whole sacred science causes you to externalize your autonomy to the group or to the leaders so let's look at the LDS way of using sacred science. Um, these will show LDS examples that will offer context for these abstract ideas we've been talking about, show evidence that the LDS church uses these practices, and will demonstrate the process of personal deconstruction. Like this is how it actually works. Like you go through the doctrines and you go, wow, and look at it with new eyes. Um, this should be for um, anyone, at least for Mormonism, and probably any Bible-based group ought to maybe relate to some of it, um, validating, instructive, and promote self-awareness. So this is from, this shows that um, Mormonism is the universal one way. This is from a Book of Mormon verse from the Book of Mosiah, and this was a book written by Joseph Smith and claiming to be an ancient scripture that was speaking for God.
Yea, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess before him, meaning Jesus. Yea, even at the last day, when all men shall stand to be judged of him, then shall they confess that he is God, and they shall quake and tremble and shrink beneath the glance of his all-searching eye. And so that just goes to show everyone someday is going to be Mormon, and some people are going to be really upset about that. The leaders speak for God. This is from another LDS scripture, Doctrine and Covenants 138, written by Joseph Smith, who is claiming to speak for God. What I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself. And though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or the voice of my servants, it is the same. This is a quote from the prophet Thomas S. Munson. Um, he has since passed, and so there's a new prophet, but this was in 2013 to the General Conference, speaking to all members of the church um, for in lieu of God. Um, so he says, uh, we all just assume he's speaking for God. That's kind of how it goes. Unless he says something wrong, and then he's like, oh no, I was speaking as a man, and that's double bind. That's a whole other one. Um, anyway, he says, there's no need for you and me in this enlightened age when the fullness of the gospel has been restored to sail uncharted seas or to travel unmarked roads in search of truth. A loving Heavenly Father has plotted our course and provided an unfailing guide, even obedience. A knowledge of truth and the answers to our greatest questions come to us as we are obedient to the commandments of the Lord. And so that just shows that he's setting it up as an infallible system which cannot be questioned. Also setting up for why you should obey him. The ends justify the means. So this is from the LDS website. Uh, it was up there as of January under the topic of obedience. It says some people feel that the commandments are burdensome and that they limit freedom and personal growth. But the Savior taught that true freedom comes from only from following him. There's that only, right? God gives commandments for our benefit. They are loving instructions for our happiness and for our physical and spiritual well-being. One reason we are here on earth is to show our willingness to obey Heavenly Father's commandments. Again, obey the Mormon leader's commandments. Um, here's a couple of other techniques and how they work with sacred science. So demand for purity is the perfectionism. Um, it basically states that per perfect personal purity is vital for the ends, the happiness or salvation or pleasing the abuser. Blame reversal basically is that if those promises that are made are not fulfilled, it's always 100% the member's lack of purity or faith or effort. And the leaders of the group may, um, may never share any of that blame. They're not to be questioned. Dispensing of existence. This is the death threat. Existence or identity depends on pleasing God. That is the leaders. A couple more. Doctrine over self. Sacred science promotes the doctrine as more important than the health or needs of the individual. Malu control means that access to information is tightly controlled so that sacred science is never challenged. And elitism, the members of the group are elevated over outsiders to soothe their disappointment and tie their own self-esteem to the greatness of the leaders. So what's the man behind the curtain? So what's the process of unpacking? So awareness really does most of the work. After I read all those books, like it really helps. Like, I, I'm always going to be uncovering stuff, but just like 80%, just, just knowing about it and making my own connections. Oh, yeah, I re that reminds me of that thing that I heard or read or that doctrine that I believed. And ultimately, healing follows to the survivor. So we can have guides, we can have books, and we can have therapists, but ultimately the survivor has to do all the work. Every survivor has their own mental construct of the group. Everyone has their own understanding. Um, I believe that there are, uh, is a, one different religion for every person that is in a religion on earth. Everyone understands their own religion differently. Through deconstruction, the survivor can see the man behind that curtain, and that helps the survivor decode their manipulation behind those doctrines. And that, again, that's work that the person, the survivor has to do on their own. That helps them individuate their own personality from the group so they can understand their own behaviors and emotions and who they really are, their own identity, and they can flip that blame right back around and put it back on the group. We could talk about blame all day, by the way. Everybody has some level of choice in their actions. Um, that's like a gradient. Um, it's just a matter of, and, and we, there's room for uh, searching yourself, um, but um, the habit was to blame yourself. And so the habit is to flip it back, even if there's some nuance in between. So here's a, a quite a few slides for overcoming sacred science. Uh, 
so uh, first of all, identify your own way that your own group used sacred science. That is literally the whole process. So what reasoning was used to elevate the leaders? What prom promises did the group make? Did they fail to keep them? And did they shift the blame to you? Reframe and deconstruct the situation and doctrines. Look at it from your new post-religious ways or po post that particular cult. Um, does it make sense that these leaders are really that much better than you? And what ways were you taught not to question? Do the ends really justify the means? And you can also change words um, or specifics of those doctrines and see if they still make sense. So for instance, if you imagine those same words being said by someone that you think is unhealthy or evil, does that change what, what it means to you? Um, this one, I got this advice from someone on Twitter, I think, um, read scriptures and replace the word God with Kevin and see if it still makes any sense. And what would you think if someone else was telling you about this from a different group? And what would you, what would you think about their situation? Think about how these things affected you. And it's really important to learn to trust your instincts. That's one of the things they got us to not do is to ignore. They got us to not trust our instincts. Um, and especially if those instincts went against their, their ends. They told us that our right instincts were the spirit and the wrong in instincts were the devil or Satan or some external force. They told us there is only one right answer and there aren't. There's no one right, wrong answer. Um, the associations, like the way your brain works with its synaptic pathways, um, you're going to connect things to things and they may not always make sense, but that's where your brain filed them. And so learning how to trust, this is, I did some dream work a while back. It was really good for getting me to learn to trust my subconscious symbols um, and the associations that I had. Also, it, some EMDR therapy helps me do that as well. So however it is you choose to do it, um, learning to trust your instincts is part of this process. And remember, this is all in them. You didn't choose to be manipulated. If they told you up front what was going to happen, you wouldn't have chosen it. Everyone's spiritual path is their own. We can leave with a tendency to want to proselytize um, and have that sacred science tendency that there's one way to do things. So my way is the way to do things. Um, and so it's important to remember that everybody's spiritual, psychological, subjective path is their own to follow. There's no universal path that fits everybody. There's only one hard rule, in my opinion, don't cause harm. Other than that, your morality, how you choose to spend your time, what causes you choose to take up or not. If you want to take a few years or the rest of your life off and do absolutely nothing, like as long as you're not causing harm, um, you need to give yourself that space. Spiritual beliefs are like art, so they're inherently personal and subjective. You can't make someone like chocolate or like Picasso or dislike, um, you know, uh, some other artist, <laughs> Renaissance paintings or something. Um, when someone turns these into objective claims, they become that's when they become pushy and preachy. We can frame spiritual statements as I feel. So we can talk about um, experiences that we've had or things that are helping us out psychologically or spiritually. And if we start things with I feel, we um, it helps us avoid that universalism um, rather than saying God says this or that. So compare, I feel comforted when I pray, to prayer is the only way to communicate with God. Your path is 100% your own and nobody else can decide that. And the same goes for others. You have no right to dictate anyone else's path. It'd probably be good at some point to do a values inventory. There's lots of ways to do that. Don't have total time to get in here. Um, a few methods that have helped for me. There were some cards I had a while back with different feelings and values on it. And I would just grab the ones that resonated with me and I put them in a pile and they looked at them later. Um, you can look at uh, lists of values and morals uh, and see which ones resonate with you. Um, you know, you, that'll help you decide like, where did, did I get this idea and behavior from the group or is it my choice? And you get to decide what you value. And we spend time on what we value. Sometimes we don't think we value something, but it's what we do with our values that really matters. Um, and so um, we can learn something by looking at our behavior rather than just what's up here. And have you found out ways outside your group to accomplish your values? And you're the judge. Um, so a the best piece of advice that I learned way back in a support group in the 90s was take what you like and leave the rest. Um, you can, it, not every book is 100% true or 100% false. Everything has a little nugget in there that you're going to uh, latch onto or not, and you can, you're allowed to pick and choose. And this is an ongoing process 20 years on, and I'm still discovering new impacts. Um, power versus empowerment. I do want to leave room for questions. Sorry, we're good. Um, 
I, I think that power is our ability to make choices for other people and empowerment is our ability to make choices for ourselves. So if we find ways to empower ourselves, um, here's a few things that I did right when I was right out of the church, had no guidance, no support groups or anything about this. Um, I went right online and I, I heard you could get an ordination through the Universal Life community or whatever ULCC, I don't even know. I have a ULC ordination and they don't care so much about what you do with it that they don't even care what I call them. <laughs> um, I did that in 2001. I think they're still handing out ordinations. And that proved to me like God didn't appoint me or did God appoint me? I don't know, but it wasn't some guy in some suit somewhere in Utah um, that appointed me. Like I got to choose to go out there and appoint myself. Um, and I'm presently writing my own scriptures. That's a process where I'm reframing LDS doctrines in a way that fits my morality and my new standards in a non-toxic way, in a fulfilling way for me. I, I don't know what I'm going to do with them, um, but that's just an exercise I'm doing. I, I can speak for God. You can speak for God. Anybody can speak for God <laughs> or not God if we don't believe in God. And I honestly don't believe in God. Like talk about God a lot, but uh, just as a concept, maybe not necessarily. Maybe I'm pantheist. I don't know. I'm not agnostic though. <laughs> and um, you can use cognitive dissonance to your own benefit. So you can make decisions now about your standards for truth. Like what is your um, epistemology? How are you going to decide what is true and what isn't? So um, I, when I was in Mormonism, the scriptures and the prophet were the, the highest standard of truth. And when I left, I naturally just um, migrated to deciding to use reason and evidence as my ultimate standard of truth. So when I feel cognitive dissonance, I notice it and I say, okay, um, what's the evidence and do we have enough evidence to know for sure and I, I even have a category of belief I call a pseudo belief where there isn't any evidence su to support it but I like how it feels or it's interesting to think about and so I kind of believe it but if someone came up with evidence or if it turned out to be harmful or something I'm not too attached to it I can set it down Think about how your sacred science conditioning might be affecting others. Um, learn about boundaries, how to respect other people's boundaries and how to set them yourself. Do you still have a sense of rightness that can't be questioned that you might be pushing onto other people about anything? It doesn't have to be about religion. Learn to reframe your moral priorities. So um, I've been unpacking a lot of stuff. We'll talk here in a second about white supremacy um, and um, really uncovering, like learning about morals and thinking about morals and what my moral priorities ought to be. And I've been shifting those around quite a bit as I learn about other people's experiences. And take a look at how sacred science might be um, in the larger society. And I think white supremacy is a really good example of that because it does make universal statements of truth, pulls everyone in with these sort of subconscious um, beliefs in that white supremacy that are passed through our media and so forth. Um, there are doctrines surrounding that and I've been unpacking that in myself. And um, it's basically a whiteness as an unquestionable system where the ends justify the means. Uh, there's here are um, this final slide. Um, my contact information is up there um, and some further resources. I did do a very long, I think it was 17 hour, five part series um, with the Mormon Stories podcast on YouTube. Um, you should be able to search um, Mormon Stories 1443 to get the first part of that. Um, my book, Recovering Agency, Lifting the Veil of Mormon Mind Control, and my website, recoveringagency.com. I have a lot of free articles and um, blog posts up there. Um, one of my favorite books in this field was Captive Hearts, Captive Minds. Um, there's a new edition called Take Back Your Life, and that's by Madeline Tobias and Yanya Lalich. Recovery from Cults is a collection of essays and papers um, edited by Michael Lingoni. Got a lot out of that. It's a little bit older, so they've come out with one that's aimed for helping professionals um, more recently called Cult Recovery, a Clinician's Guide to Working with Former Members and Families. Very long technical um, clinical title um, that's edited by Lorna and William Goldberg, Roseanne Henry, and Michael Langoni. And um, referring you also to the International Cultic Studies Association, um, which is um, continuing to run conferences and has publications on this topic. And that's it. So, any questions? That was uh, terrific. <laughs> wow, you packed Thank so you. much in there. Someone has asked, uh, they said, these slides are incredibly helpful. Is there any chance you might be willing to make a PDF of them available to conference attendees? 
Yes, I don't know if I can make it a PDF, but I can do that. Um, so reach out to me at that email address, and I'm um, also planning to put up, I should have done it beforehand, um, make a blog post with a link to, um, I'll probably do it through Google Docs or something like that, and it'll probably still be in a PowerPoint format. Um, but yes, I would, I'm happy to make these slides available. Excellent, thank you. Um, someone else has a question. Is your immediate family still Mormon and how do they feel about the work that you do? Um, some of my families, I was actually alone for many, 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 many years. Um, some of my um, like extended sibling and their children like, blah, 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 um, are out. Um, my parents are still in and some other people are still in. I live with my parents presently, so it is a constant source of contention. Um, Boundary setting is the thing that I have to do a lot. Um, mm -hmm. My mom tries really hard not to be preachy, but she gets there sometimes. And I mm -hmm. re recently had to do it again. You're doing it again, mom. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a lot of arguments. They're also politically very different from me. So uh, it is very difficult to navigate. And, oh, and cool. in Mormonism, that is probably one of the biggest problems that people ask me about is navigating family relationships, however that looks to them. Some people get outright banned. Um, it's not like Jehovah's Witness where um, there's a strict um, shunning policy. There's The church just doesn't kind of, they do their double binds. We're like, oh, we should love everybody, but also these sins are so horrible and you shouldn't hang out with those people. So it's kind of up to each individual to ch pick and choose which of those, are we going to shun this person or are we going to get all preachy and up in their business? So. Mm -hmm. Kind of not much in between, it's either preachy or shunning. <laughs> right. Um, and yeah. uh, someone wondered uh, what caused you to leave Mormonism. Was it a certain event or was it, did it take place over time? Um, most of these things happen over time. Ex-Mormons have a concept called, that we say, my shelf broke. And that's because right. some prophet way back when said that you should put your doubts on a shelf. Um, so I did have quite a few things on my shelf. Um, there was a, an epiphany that I had. It's kind of complicated. It has to do with, I was um, researching artificial intelligences at the time, a thing called the technological singularity. And I was doing some writing about it. And I um, realized that all of the assumptions I was making about this um, artificial intelligence being would also apply to God. And that that was very different from the God that I had been taught. And I, um, at that very, it was like a lightning bolt hit me and just, I was just like, I can't believe in a revealed God. I, I could maybe believe in some kind of God, like an artificial intelligence God or aliens or whatever it is, but like the, the very personal concept of a God that is in any revealed prophetic religion, um, I, I could no longer bring myself to believe whatsoever. So that was my moment. Wow. Yes, uh, we did. We got another question here. Mm -hmm. Is religion necessary to have a community with all of those good qualities that you listed under healthy religions? Um, I don't think a religion is necessary. And those were healthy groups, by the way. So those could be any kind of group. Um, I think that people, individuals should kind of pull together their own community. I'm very much about it, found families and things like that. Um, and I don't know what the future holds. I do think that humanity does need to find ways to address um, the gaps that religion presently fills. Um, this includes like psychological help um, and fulfillment, moral systems, community, um, how we help each other, um, our, our sense of, I mean, people have religious experiences. I have had spiritual experiences um, and they're very important and sacred to me. Um, but I believe that I have the right to interpret those and I don't allow anyone else to interpret those for me. So if we can come up with a, a healthy system that would encompass all of those things, I don't think it has to be a religion necessarily, sorry, but I think I think it will be religions, probably multiple of them. There are many examples of healthy religions and there are, um, there's a, this deconstruction movement afoot and that's got to turn into something healthier. Um, they're not all going to leave evangelicalism. Mormonism has its own progressive movement, which I heavily support. Um, people who decide to stay in spite of all of its problems and deceptions and are trying to transform it from within. That is not my work. Um, but it is their work and it's their calling. And if they choose to follow that, then who am I to question that? I'm not going to be culty and question that for them. Um, and so I, I believe that like a, a healthier version of Mormonism would be better than, than what we have now. So. 
Very interesting. And uh, certainly uh, a lot of our speakers this weekend uh, would not agree that there are um, healthy religions, uh, but you are here to uh, share what you think with us. And I'm so grateful uh, for the amount of work that you put into preparing uh, all these slides and getting this information ready for us. Wow, it was really uh, fantastic. And I'm sure you'll hear from people who would like um, a PDF or like copies of these slides to refer back to. So yeah, thank you. Sounds Luna. good. It's been thank a you real for, treat. Yeah, thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you a lot. Good. Yes. Well, can you believe it? We are at the end of day two. Tomorrow will be our final day of court 2023. And tomorrow morning, we're starting off with a very important session, the church and cultural genocide, indigenous perspectives. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to that. I, I feel that it'll be uh, emotional, it'll be educational, um, it'll be something definitely worth um, participating in. I want to again thank our sponsors, um, Recovering from Religion, Religion in Remission, Aaron Donnelly, and of course, Dr. Coco Owen. Thank you for sponsoring the Conference on Religious Trauma this year. Uh, I'd like to invite you to join us uh, in the Court Cafe if you feel um, ready for some socializing with other attendees and hopefully some of our speakers will join us in there as well. And I do want to remind you that um, we have merchandise available for Court and I'll have uh, Sunny or Heather put a link there so that you can go and take a look at some of the merchandise we have. And otherwise, we'll see you shortly in Court Cafe. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>